Hello everyone, I'm Alex Dykes, and today we're taking a look at the all-new for 2013 Fiat 500 electric. Now this car is available in colors other than this orange hue we have here, but it's not available in states other than California. The electrified Fiat 500 is what's called a compliance car, and what that means is that California has a law that says a certain number of cars must be EVs sold by each manufacturer by a certain date. Now, of course, that date in California is kind of a moving target. It's been adjusted several times, but it is coming. Now, the other part of that you need to know is one EV sale required by that law doesn't mean one real EV like this actually out on the road because there's a series of credits and trades and partial credits for hybrids and partial hybrids, etc. So, bottom line, these are sold only in California because California law says that they must exist. The funny thing is that even though the Fiat 500 electric exists only because of European and California legislation, it's one of the more attractive EVs out on the market. I personally think that this ties with the Tesla Model S for the most attractive EV currently available. The other thing is it's quite discreet. You'll notice that other than the 500E badging here and on the rear, there's not a whole lot going on to indicate that this is a plug-in vehicle. This fuel door even looks like a regular Fiat 500 fuel door. Uh, there are no decals on the side like there are with the BMW Active E, no crazy things going on in the styling like there are with the Nissan Leaf. Of course, Fiat did make changes to make the 500E more efficient in terms of aerodynamics than a regular Fiat 500. And that starts out with this front grille, which is unique to the Fiat 500E and has this sort of golf ball hole pattern going on. The 500E also has unique wheels, and these are designed to increase aerodynamic efficiency of the car. Now, a regular car would have large open areas in the wheel and fairly narrow spokes because they need to be able to cool the brakes. But that isn't a requirement in an EV, strangely, because if you think about it, the vast majority of the braking is done by the regenerative braking system of the car to try and recover that kinetic energy back into electrical energy. So we don't have as much of a cooling requirement going on in the wheels, which means that we can put these little plastic fins here to help improve the aerodynamic efficiency of those wheels. We have the same sort of lower aero treatments going on in the Fiat 500 back here that we had in the front. And of course we have a functional spoiler in the back of the 500E, but it's not designed to reduce lift, it's designed to reduce drag. Like most electric cars, there's not a whole lot to look at under the hood of the 500E, but we'll take off this cover anyway. Now, nestled under all of this mass of electronics, we have the 111 horsepower electric motor. It produces 147 pound-feet of torque. Now, over here we have the DC to AC inverter. This is what converts the DC power from that battery into AC power that the motor can use. We have our 12-volt battery here. Now, you're thinking, why does it have a battery if it's a battery electric vehicle? Well, the, the reason that this exists is to run the 12-volt accessories in the car and to sort of provide a buffer between that uh, inverter stage and the DC power stage in this car to this low-voltage DC system in the car. It's just good practice in EVs, we're told. Now, nestled right under there with the electric motor is the one-speed transmission. A transmission is kind of a disingenuous way of describing that because all it is is an over-glorified reduction gear and a differential. There's no reverse gear, there are no planetary gear sets like there would be in a regular transmission because the electric motor doesn't need them. If you want to go in reverse, you just spin the motor backwards. If you want to go faster, you spin the motor faster. Now over here we have two coolant tanks. That seems a little bit odd, but this inverter does require cooling because it does get a little bit warm. And of course that motor requires cooling as well, so that's why they're those two different cooling systems. If you're familiar with the regular gasoline Fiat 500, you'll note that this is a decent amount more powerful than that gasoline Fiat 500, and it is faster as well. We clocked two seconds faster, zero to 60 in this car, than we did in that regular Fiat 500. You're probably wondering where are the batteries, and that's a good question. Now they're under the car. They're in a tray that's specially designed for the Fiat 500, and they go all the way from the firewall all the way just about to this rear axle. It packs a 24 kilowatt hour usable battery, which is roughly the same size as the Nissan Leaf. The 500E is not a terribly big car, but 24 kilowatt hours is a pretty big battery pack and didn't all fit under the car, so they had to put some of it inside the car. Instead of eating up cargo room, they chose this rear floorboard area, so the floor height back here for the rear passengers is four inches taller than it is in the regular gasoline model. That changes the dynamics of the rear seat uh, a little bit, which we'll go over in a second. Rather than something like a Leaf, which has the charging port up front, the 500E keeps the regular fuel filler door location. This is a J1772 standard socket, and you plug the power cord in right like that. Let's stop and talk charging for a moment. This is an industry standard J1772 charging connector, and it provides 110 or 240 volts to the charger on board the car. Now you heard that right, this is not a charger, and those things you see on the street corners and in parking lots, etc., 
are not chargers, they're really electric vehicle supply equipment. And this is a 110 volt electric vehicle supply equipment here. It has a regular old 110 volt plug there. Now all it really does is it tells the car, hey, I have 120 volts or 240 volts available to you and this is how much power you can draw out of the system. The charger is really integrated into the car and this Fiat 500e has a 6.6 .6 kilowatt charger in it. It's pretty much the industry standard at this moment. The Leaf and a number of other EVs all have 6.6 .6 kilowatt chargers. If you get a Tesla, they have the option of a 10 or a 20 kilowatt charger so they can charge much faster. But of course, remember that those Teslas use more power to go a mile as well. Now those Teslas not only use more power, but they also use a different charging connector. Tesla bucked the trend and is not using this industry standard J1772 charging connector. They're using a Tesla exclusive charging connector. There is an adapter available, of course, so you can charge your Tesla with any old EV charging station, but the cord and the plug that come with your Tesla don't look like this. They're completely different. If you're plugged into a 240 volt or level two station, as they're also known, then the 500E will charge completely from zero in about four hours. If you only have access to this 120 volt cord, then it takes about 24 to 25 hours to completely fill your 500E. That's roughly the same as the current generation Nissan Leaf, as well as the Ford Focus Electric. You'll notice that there's only one plug behind this little door, and that's because the 500E does not support the Chatamo 400 volt DC quick charging station that the Nissan Leafs support. And that DC quick charge station does mean that the Leaf can get about a half battery charge in under 30 minutes. In order to get the orange creamsicle theme that our tester has, you first have to pay $500 for that orange exterior paint, then you have to pay an extra $395 for these white dashboard trim plastics. We do get this very striking orange and white steering wheel, however, if you look at that, only this interior part of the wheel is orange and the rest of that is all this very light white color. We get all this white trim on the inside, we get the white climate control modules, and of course we get the white center console as well. The white theme continues onto the seats with this orange stripe and white vinyl. And this is not vinyl, this is sort of a uh, very strange fabric that doesn't breathe terribly well. Uh, if we move up the seat here, we can see that we have an orange headrest in this model, which goes with that orange striping. All 500E models in the US come with this otherwise optional plug-in TomTom navigation system that snaps into a little port in the dash. We also get the premium audio system, which is an option in regular 500 models, as well as the single zone climate control. Now instead of the regular shifter, we get this push button arrangement, although I think it's a pity that Fiat didn't use this opportunity to free up this entire dashboard space by putting those buttons somewhere else. If we scoot down to the cup holders, you can see that we couldn't put two large uh, drive through style drinks in the 500 at the same time, they would interfere with one another, so you really can only fit one in this slot. If we go further back, we will find another cup holder back here, sort of under the driver's armrest, and you can fit a large soda in that one. Front seat comfort in the 500 is kind of a mixed bag. We only have a few ways of adjusting the seat. We have the manual recline mechanism, which is over on the right, kind of an unusual place for it, and we have the height adjustment lever here at the front on the left. Now when you adjust the height of the seat, it also changes the seat bottom cushion angle, something that I really don't prefer. We don't have any adjustable lumbar support in the seat, and what is there is fairly minor. We also don't get a telescoping steering wheel, this only adjusts for tilt, as you can see. Now what that means for my body shape is I have somewhat longish legs, so if this seat is adjusted for me at the back of its travel in the car, and that's fairly comfortable for my legs, then the steering wheel just feels like it's a little bit too far away. And if I try and tilt it down for a better driving position, then I can't see all of the gauges. Let's take a look at that back seat now. The front seat folds and slides forward fairly easily, and getting in the back isn't as horrible as it is in many sports cars. If we move the seat back into position and scoot this rear headrest all the way up for me, you can see that I can fit in the back. I'm six feet tall, my head is touching the ceiling, my knees are touching this front seat adjusted for me uh, at six feet tall, but it's, it's livable for a short time in the car. Now these rear seats aren't as comfortable as they would be in a gasoline Fiat 500, again because those batteries occupy some rear floor space. This floor is again four inches higher than it would be in a gasoline Fiat 500, which means that my legs are four inches higher up into my chest. For such a small car, the 500 has a fairly decently sized trunk. This is the largest carry-on bag you can carry on a domestic flight. So you can see it fits quite easily back here in a variety of different orientations. If we take it out, there's also some additional storage underneath this little cubby. That's also where you can put your 110 volt emergency charger. 
if we remove this very small cargo cover here and fold down these back seats, you'll notice that there is a decent amount of cargo room available in the Fiat 500 electric, just like there is in the regular Fiat 500. This is better than a smart car or something like a Scion IQ, and it's just about the same as a regular two-door Mini. With those rear seats back in place, it's time for our exclusive trunk comfort index. And I must point out one nice thing about the 500. The base 500 is not a terribly expensive car. The Pop 500 gasoline edition is right around $16,000. And it has something that a decent amount of much more expensive vehicles don't have, which is a nice way to close the trunk. I mean, it is a fairly cheap piece of material. As you can see here, it's just a little strap, but that is an awful lot more convenient than most cars. Now, I can't actually close this door on myself, so I'm going to have to give this trunk area a 2 out of 10 in our exclusive trunk comfort index. All Fiat 500 electrics come standard with the premium audio system. This is an option in the regular Fiat 500, standard in the 500 electric. We have this single uh, alpha only display here. We have our media input, and that's uh, USB as well as iPod interface, Sirius satellite radio as well as AM FM over here on the tuner button, and of course we get our presets across the front. Very basic interface there. We move up here to the optional TomTom Tom navigation system, which is of course standard in the Fiat 500e as again. Uh, I'm told that in Canada, this TomTom Tom nav system is not included in the Fiat 500e, so that's something to keep in mind if you're watching this from the Great White North. Uh, now this is a fairly standard TomTom uh, Tom interface. We have our navigation screen there. If we go back, we have our car menu, and this is what's unique is that they've integrated some Fiat specific software here. So we have access to our trip computer, in the car, instant information, trip A, trip B, as you can see there. We go back, we have our instant energy screen, we can change our charging schedule, and we can see where all of our power is going right now, uh, climate control, other systems, motor, etc. We also get a media player interface. Uh, if we click over to USB library, you can see that we can actually browse our device using this TomTom Tom screen here, but it's not the most intuitive interface. Again, this is just displaying a list, uh, artists starting with AA to TH, not the most uh, intuitive way of navigating your device. Now this TomTom Tom is paired to the car via Bluetooth and it does have its own pairing to the car in that way for the system to operate. Let's go over the controls now in the Fiat 500e because they are a little bit unusual and they do control the radio over there on the dashboard, the TomTom Tom up there, as well as this seven inch LCD instrument cluster. First off, because this is a Fiat product and Fiat and Chrysler are in bed together, we have the audio controls on the back of the steering wheel. So on this right side of the steering wheel, this is up and down for the volume. And on the other side of the steering wheel, we get track up and down. And of course, we can change our sources with that as well. Over here, you'll see we have our Bluetooth voice command option. You can voice command certain things in the system, uh, but uh, ultimately a lot of those things will end up in menus on the seven inch instrument cluster, which you have to navigate using the buttons on the back of the steering wheel on this side. This is our main menu button which takes us into this menu on the car, and you can see your recent calls, your phone book, your message reader, your media player, etc. The media player is how you would change your playlists, artists, uh, genres, etc. on your USB or your iDevice. Uh, using this controls, you can see it has that same abbreviated format there. You can go through there and then pick another um, album that way, and then it will start playing. And then of course that uh, information will then be displayed on your TomTom Tom nav system as well as the small screen on the radio. If we go back to that menu, you'll notice an option for navigator and you can use the buttons on the steering wheel, again on the back of the steering wheel here as you can see to control that TomTom Tom and change options on its screen. This is perhaps one of the more convoluted uh, methods of controlling a TomTom Tom that I've ever seen. Um, but you can do it from the screen if you really should want to. There's another thing going on with the screen. You'll notice we can toggle through motor power that tells us the instantaneous power the motor is using or recharging into the system. We can see our trip economy and we can see our tire pressure and then we can go back to this charging status screen. If the car was ready and it was in drive, it would just have a little picture of a car and it would say ready. Now all of that is changed by this trip button on the stock over here. And there's yet another menu going because if we hit this menu button here, we get a different menu on the screen that allows us to change our charging schedule, set date, time, battery display, and other system options for the car. Uh, I'm not exactly clear why they jammed so many things into this display and then had, what is that, four different methods of controlling things in this car as well as that display. It is a little bit convoluted. I hope that the Fiat 500L, which is coming out soon uh, and has that new Uconnect 5-inch system, I, I certainly hope that that has a more integrated approach to this.
The way the Fiat 500e behaves on the road is completely defined by this electric drivetrain. Now, motors deliver all their torque nearly instantly and at essentially zero RPM, so all 147 pound-feet of torque are available from that stoplight race. That means that if you were lined up against a regular gasoline Fiat 500, you'd beat it off the line every time and all the way up to about 60 miles an hour or so. We scored zero to 60 in 7.87 seconds in this car, which is about two seconds faster than the gasoline Fiat 500 with the automatic transmission. Now that continues right up to around maybe about 70 miles an hour or so when things start to lose a bit of steam and that's thanks to that one speed transmission in this car. This car tops out at 88 miles per hour where the regular Fiat 500 goes up to over 100 miles an hour. And that's again because of that single speed transmission as well as the desire to try and preserve that battery pack. Because it's really not good for the battery to be discharged terribly quickly, uh, when you're going 88 miles an hour or much faster than that, you're draining an awful lot of power from this car because the power required to go you know, beyond freeway speeds, average freeway speeds, I should say, it's not a linear scale. So the faster you go, the more power it needs to go faster. A good, good example of that is, for instance, about 300 horsepower is required for the average car to go around 170 miles an hour or so. And when you take a look at the Bugatti Veyron and how fast it can go, it's about 250 miles an hour or so, and it's a thousand power car. So that other 700 horsepower is required to go that extra, you know, 80, 90 miles an hour on the freeway. Wind resistance is a huge, huge factor. And that's one of those reasons they try and keep these EVs uh, to 88 miles an hour or so, uh, just again for efficiency. Even when you look at something like the Tesla Model S, it has a top speed of 130 miles an hour rather than 155, like most of its luxury sports car competition. The electrification of the Fiat 500 has a huge impact on curb weight and therefore handling. So we're up 600 pounds over the gasoline version in curb weight, but fortunately that weight is fairly evenly distributed. So this has a more, more neutral and more advantageous weight balance than a gasoline Fiat 500. That's really noticeable in these, on these winding mountain roads because the neutral handling characteristics of the Fiat 500, and that is when you're not powering around a corner, are much better balanced than in the regular gasoline version. And that means that the front end of the car doesn't tend to plow as much when you lose grip. And you will lose grip quite frequently in the Fiat 500e versus that gasoline Fiat uh, because of course we have low rolling resistance tires which is something that every manufacturer puts on their EV cars as well as their hybrids to help improve efficiency. In terms of efficiency, the Fiat 500e is rated for 119 mpge or miles per gallon equivalent and we've been averaging about 144 miles per gallon equivalent over our 650 mixed miles in this Fiat 500. Now, about that MPGE thing, I think it's the dumbest thing that the EPA could have come up with. Basically, what the EPA did was they decided that they needed to relate the fuel economy of EVs to uh, you know, regular gasoline cars. So they decided how much energy was in a gallon of gasoline by how much heat it could produce if you burnt it. And then they decided how much energy it would take to do the same amount of heat with electricity. And they basically came up with 34 kilowatt hours of power equaling one gallon of gasoline. In a nutshell, MPGE means nothing to me because that's not how you buy power in this country. You buy power in kilowatt hours and you're charging it rates defined in kilowatts for this car. So this is a 24 kilowatt hour battery and it charges at a maximum rate of six kilowatts. So that means that for every hour of charging, I get six kilowatt hours of battery power back into the battery if you're charging at the maximum 240 volt rate. And that's good for 18 to 24 miles. Now if you're charging at 120 volts using that emergency charger that comes with the car, then you're charging at a rate of about one kilowatt. So that means one kilowatt hour for every hour of charging. It doesn't mean you're gonna get uh, too far on that hour of charging with 120 volts. It's gonna be three to four miles for every hour of charging on that 120 volt cable. But in those terms, you know where you're going with this car, and MPGE just means nothing to me. So this car tells me my average uh, fuel economy right now is 144 MPGE. That's lovely, but what I really wanna know is how many kilowatts per, per mile, or how many kilowatt hours per mile I'm using. So even I'm getting the terminology a little bit funny here, but it will become second nature over time if you have an EV. This car right now says I have 19 miles range left, and that's because I was just going up a hill, and it doesn't know that the 33% left on this battery in my drive is good for more like 30 to 40 miles because I don't plan on going up a hill again. Again, the car doesn't know that, but I as the driver do. However, this car isn't giving me the tools to accurately determine my range by myself. So if it told me on average, you can go this many miles for a kilowatt hour, then I would be able to look at that percentage, even if better yet, actually, if the percentage gauge told me how many kilowatt hours I had left in the battery instead of a pure percentage or displayed both, 
Uh, but either way, if I had those numbers, I could base my own estimate on those numbers and then I could have a more realistic uh, idea of exactly how much range I had in this car. Just something to consider. It's time for the nitty gritty. At $31,800, the 500E is a decent amount more expensive than a base Fiat 500 Pop, which is around $16,000 or so. After you've added all the options that our tester has here, it ends up being $34,445. That is fairly inexpensive as far as EVs go, but as far as regular vehicles go, it is quite expensive, so you're unlikely to save any money in the long run. If you're doing this for environmental reasons, then supposedly if you live in California, this is a great deal uh, more environmentally friendly to drive even than a Prius. Uh, based on the average emissions from US power plants in California, this is still cleaner than driving that Prius. The 500D is probably the most fun to drive EV on the market this side of the Tesla Model S. Now we wouldn't normally compare something like a Fiat 500 to something like a Nissan Leaf because they're just not the same kind of vehicle. One's a four-door hatchback, this one's a two-door hatchback. But because they're both EVs and they're both in this very small segment of EVs in the world, they do end up being compared. And the Nissan Leaf is a great deal more practical. It's not nearly as much fun to drive, mind you, but a lot more practical. We also have that least only fit EV from Honda, which is a good alternative to this as well, something you should definitely keep in mind. You should also keep in mind what it's like to live with an EV long term. You can check out our links down below in the description section for my experience on our week with this Fiat 500 electric and what I thought about it. You can also subscribe to us by clicking that little bar at the bottom of your video so you can check out our other reviews. You can comment on this video, tell us what you liked, what you didn't like, and of course check out next week because we'll have a BMW X6M, which is the polar opposite of this 500e.